Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Chrysanthemums are a fall favorite. Today we're going to talk about the different kinds and how to take care of them. Also, some wildlife thrives in modern urban sprawl. We'll see what we can do to encourage or discourage the animals. That's just ahead of the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Ms. Joellen is a TSU Extension Agent in Tempton County. And Mr. Huh? D is here. Howdy. Thanks for joining us. This is going to be a fun show. We are. <laughs> All right, Joel. Let's talk about chrysanthemums because that time is almost near, right? Yes. Okay. September. Mm -hmm. Perfect time to get chrysanthemums. Now, they'll be showing up in all the stores yes. and everywhere, um, all different colors. They have done an excellent job of creating all of these different colors for us to have beauty mm -hmm. at our own house. Uh, decorate for fall decorations, yeah. everything. And this is one thing you have to, if you see something in September blooming and it's beautiful and you want to bring it home, that's great. It'll last about two to three weeks, depending on the weather. The cooler <laughs> it is, you know, worse, the longer the blooms will last. Okay. But that was an early blooming mum. There early are, blooming. yeah, there's okay. early, uh -huh. mid, and late blooming mums. That's why when you, you see, well, I see them at the stores all the time. And well, yeah, <laughs> they, when they get them in, they have early blooming mums, there's mid season blooming mums, and there's late season blooming mums. So, but just okay, you can go find another one right. and replace so. it. So that's the beauty of the long season of mums because we have those three different kinds. Now, a lot of people ask, Will the mums last? Will they last? Yes, That's going to be the because question. chrysanthemums are perennial, and they all came from perennial mums, okay. but they've been hybridized so much, and the florist trade has really taken on mums, and there are a lot of florist mums in the trade. I mean, and you get a flower arrangement from any place, and they've got mums uh, in them. Yeah. So those are grown for different reasons, and they were all perennial at one time, and they probably still are in certain places. Now the garden mums you get at the store, uh, they can be perennial, but you know they're usually zones what two to nine somewhere in there, so those people can usually keep them if they have the right spot, and that's the problem, finding the right spot. Now I have kept them before, and they'll stay for a few years, but then something will happen and some of them will go. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people I know will have them, but they are in usually in raised areas. They, they are well drained because they don't like to have wet roots okay. at all. And that's kind of the trouble in the Mid-South area that yeah. we have because it, it's so wet around right. here. Right. In Especially the winter, time of the year. Right. rainy season for us. Um, so that's, you know, the key is to keep them well drained in the winter time and then most likely they will come back. Um, one thing to not do if you are going to try to make them perennial in your yard, please, when they die in the cool of the uh, uh, frosts that come, leave the foliage there hmm. because that's going to protect the crown. Okay. And you, you're really supposed to leave the dead foliage and sometimes in some places further north from here, they even suggest putting straw around the crown, you know, in amongst the stems of the chrysanthemum for protection right. or some mulch of some kind that's loose. And then in the spring, you can remove all of that and then they should come back up again. And you should fertilize them in the spring. Now, what would you use the fertilizer? A, a complete fertilizer, okay. any kind of complete fertilizer. You can do a long lasting one or one that doesn't last long. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll fertilize them again in the end of June. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say, well, mine are starting to bloom. Yeah, what happens is they'll start to bloom maybe in July. Oh, really? Yeah, so, or August. And so- In the heat. In the heat. Yeah. But it, if you don't prune them before that, if you go ahead and start letting them bloom, just go ahead and let them bloom. They will, they may bloom again in the fall when it gets cooler. Okay. Uh, Cause there's, some of them are actually bred to bloom twice like that. So, you know, you never know. But if you only want the nice fall flush of bloom, then you should cut them before the 4th of July. Cut them before? Yep, cut them back before the 4th of July. Okay. 
And then when they come back out, they'll have time and then they'll bloom in the fall just once. Okay. But yeah, so they're all, they are perennial, but sometimes around here especially, it's kind of tricky to keep them. But well-drained soils is key. Okay. Fertilize. Okay. Fertilize in the spring and sometimes again in July, end of July, and then get a nice flush of blooms in the fall. Okay. So how much are we cutting back? Uh, just enough to cut off the, the top where the blooms are trying to farm, just the, the tips. Just the tips. And, you know, most of these are bred to be nice and bushy mm -hmm. like they are, so you really don't have to do a whole lot. Mine just naturally grow bushy just like they were when, they, when I got them the, the year before. Right. So, but yeah, just tip off the, all of the blooms where the blooms would be, and that will cause them to stop and regrow again and then bloom later in the fall. Okay. Any pest problems we need to know about or fungal issues? No, I've never seen fungal problems okay. with them, but I, that doesn't mean they, they won't get some, but bugs sometimes <laughs> do, you know, chew on the leaves, yeah. and a lot of times I've seen that it might actually be a caterpillar of some kind. Right. And so, you know, BT would help that, but you just look at them often. But chrysanthemums, you know, the chemical pyrethrin comes right. from chrysanthemums, so really not a whole lot bothers them. Right, yeah, and of course, Mr. D mentions that all the time. Uh -huh. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so they shouldn't have any major No, they really don't have, path. I've never had any on mine, so. Okay. Uh, they've, they're real good and they're easy to grow. Uh, like I said, it, it, you take a chance. Buy the beautiful ones that you want in the fall, try to save them, put them in a nice, well-drained area, mulch them up in the winter, see if they'll come back for you. And, and I guess full sun? They love full yeah. sun. That is, yeah, they, I'd say at least four to six hours of sun a day okay. would be good for them, because I have have them on one side of the house, and my mother has them on one side of the house, and they, it, it doesn't get sun all day long, but part of the day. I actually have another question for you. So sure. when you're out, you know, picking mums, mm -hmm. you know, for your home, do you look with, for the ones that have all of the blooms on them uh, oh. it, that are open or closed or what? That's, that's a good point. Right. Yes. No, I like to buy, buy them with lots of buds on them. Okay. Right. I want to be able to see the color. Like I'm, some of them are breaking and some of them are, uh, you know, blooming so I know what it's going to look like. Right. But I like to buy lots of buds because I know it'll last in the landscape a lot longer. Okay. Yeah, I've often wondered that because, of course, when you see them, you know, out at the big box store or some other place, yeah, they have, they're full of blooms and some are not, just have mm -hmm. little buds on them. So, yeah, so. so you get the early ones, Mr. D, there's some more coming behind that one. There is. The middle. Then there's, there's some more lot. coming behind that one. Right. That's all right. right. Got you. Because they are beautiful. You Gorgeous. Know, especially during, during the fall, you can decorate with them. I actually, you know, try to have some out, you know, mm -hmm. in the yard so that I, I do like them. But, uh, I, but I didn't know about year. the early, middle, and the late. Uh, hmm. That was new to me, so I hope the yeah. folks got that. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Joellen. That was good. Welcome. Appreciate that. All right. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, let's talk about urban sprawl and wildlife. We know you like to talk about wildlife. I like to talk about <laughs> wildlife, I do. Right. And, and, you know, I lived uh, a lot of my years in an urban area, mm -hmm. even though I grew up in a rural area. And I've, I've decided that there's more wildlife in urban areas than there are in <laughs> rural areas. How about that? Really. All right. Because it's not at all unusual to see deer and mm -hmm. uh, coyotes and raccoons and possums and armadillos yes. and all of those snakes all yeah. those things in urban areas and I've decided that uh, especially the <laughs> the prey animals the animals that predators are looking for like deer and, and critters like that like most wildlife uh -huh. uh, they feel safer around us humans especially uh -huh. in areas where you're not allowed to shoot them <laughs> and so they right. they tend to get close right. to us because they feel safer, huh. and uh, so you know it's it's just uh, uh, it's a it, it can it can be a very expensive situation. Oh, I, sure. I ran across some old uh, numbers I came up with a few years ago about deer. Okay. Deer by far are the most costly urban wildlife animal 
for us. I mean, several years ago, some of the numbers that I ran across were were like uh, we had uh, uh, one and a half million deer auto collisions per year. Now I know that's not all in urban areas, sure, but that's where most of the cars are. So uh, and, and and at a cost of about. Uh, Four billion dollars wow. a year. Now, that's several years ago. Four billion. How about that? And and you know, in the 1980s, there were 10 million deer in the United States, and estimates today are 20 to 30 million. And uh, you know, uh, so and I've personally been t-boned by a deer. Wow. Uh, 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 and there's not a lot that you can do to prevent a deer from t-boning you, but if you are driving on the road at dusk, especially during the rut, during the fall, early winter, that's the mating season. That's when deer, kind of like people, they just kind of lose their mind. <laughs> you know, they don't have any common sense. And, 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 and you know, if you happen to see a deer, deer's eyes in the headlights, it's better to have your lights on bright huh. A long blast on your horn, rather than a toot toot, right. you know, uh, might help, oh. and it and may not. And if you see one set of eyes in the headlights, expect that there may be some more. Right. Most, you know, raccoons uh, can really be a problem. Uh, snakes, mm. uh, and most of them uh, will have the same recommendations for exclusion. They'll talk about using hardware cloth mm -hmm. to kind of keep them from getting down your chimneys. If you've got a chimney, I've, I've known of raccoons that have gotten in people's chimneys and wow. raised a family. And along with a family of young raccoons, they brought fleas to oh, the house. Oh, man. Okay. And, you know, that can, that can really ah. be a problem. So excluding them if you can. Uh, be very careful. If you have one in your chimney and you exclude, put your exclusion, the hardware cloth on there where it can't get out. Oh. That can be a problem, as yeah. you can well imagine. Yes. Same thing under your house or things like that. I've had experience leaving a, walking up to a house and the, the, the door, the trap door under the house is open. And so, oh, I need to close that. So I close it and a few weeks later, the, there's an odor emanating from the house and you got an oppos possum under there that got into the heating oh, HVAC man. system and, and so, uh, and got electrocuted and, and you know. And, <laughs> So if you have critters in your attic or in your chimney or under your house, turn, figure out a way to get some lights under there and some loud music, mm. country music I prefer, <laughs> loud country music, and, 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 and give it a little time before you put your exclusion in. Right. You might also want, even when you, you know, uh, put your exclusion mechanisms up, you may want to have a trap in there, a live trap with some bait in it, just in case, just in case they right. get hungry and, oh, and you man. might actually you can then go check it in a day or two and you may have one in a trap that you that you luckily can get out of there. But uh, common sense, uh, I don't think they like chrysanthemums. <laughs> uh, I don't think deer like chrysanthemums. So plant, plant, try to plant plants that they don't really like. Vegetable garden, you know, they tend to like buffet. a lot of the same things. That, that's right. It's a buffet. It's a yeah. buffet. You know, wow. they like the same things we do, and 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 uh, electric fences, and along with the frightening, the the music and lights and stuff like that, might help where that's concerned. But you know, they were here first. Yeah. We're the ones yeah. that are. In, you know, we 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 come into their area, yeah, pushing them out, yeah. and and really they were here first, and so you need to kind of keep that in mind before you bring your 12 year old with 20 gauge out, I guess, you know. Yeah. Uh, is there such thing as deer resistant plants? I, I mean, I tend to think they're gonna yeah. try, try them out to see, but I don't know. Uh, they may, and may just take one bite, but yeah. you, in your yeah. office, you have a list. We do have a list. Of, yeah. uh, of plants that do not seem to Come be as attractive to deer. It depends on how hungry they are. Yeah, if I said, they'd probably take a bite. You know, yeah. A few years ago, we had a b very bad infestation of deer eating cotton. <laughs> Yeah, out east of, uh, of Memphis, and it simply it was dur very dry weather. They didn't have a lot to eat, and and they just devastated the cotton crop out there. Wow. So, and they don't normally right. eat cotton. So desperate enough, they eat it. That's right. right. And you notice know just as well as I do, uh, you know, being at the Agri Center, had a lot of deer at the Agri Center. 
there are, there a, are lot a lot of accidents here. right there at Walnut Grove Road exactly. as you go into the Agri Center. Mm -hmm. I would like to, somebody, I hope somewhere is keeping up with the no, numbers on that, but yeah. it would be very interesting to, to know how many uh, deer car collisions we have on Walnut Grove Road. The yeah. only thing I don't see more of uh, in this area are the predators, the big predators. Okay. I know you hear people every once in a while say they see a big cat out there, but uh, I don't know if there are, there are not a lot of them. Uh, there are red-tailed hawks, a lot of mm -hmm. red-tailed hawks in this area. You gotta watch, if you take Fifi out to feed your little <laughs> uh, French poodle, you better look out because there are a lot of uh, you know, pretty large uh, uh, predators flying predators. There are, I don't see many eagles, yeah. but there are a lot of hawks, different kinds of hawks. We have Mississippi kites that are very common out in the Agri Center area, okay. and then the red-tailed hawks and, and things yeah, like those. that. So, okay. Let's talk quickly about control measures for deer and raccoons. I know you covered a little bit about the, the deer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you can't do the 12 year over the 20 <laughs> gauge, you know, in an urban, in an urban no, area, in there urban aren't area. many that you can do that. Uh, 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 let's, let's do exclusion, you know, try to exclude them uh, using, uh, uh, for the raccoons, going into small areas, hardware cloth. Mm. Uh, and if you're going to put a hardware cloth, don't get half inch hardware cloth. Go ahead and get like one eighth inch hardware cloth. Get the real small hardware cloth because not only will it exclude the raccoons, it'll also exclude, if it's one eighth inch, it'll exclude snakes oh, okay. and it'll exclude yeah. squirrels and that it'll exclude sense. mice if it's one eighth of an inch. Uh, you know, if you get half inch, uh, you keep the raccoons out, but then the, you know, you may have snakes that show up mm. and, and mice and things like that. Uh, but you know, that's under your house, it's, that's uh, in your chimneys, that's uh, any openings that right. you have uh, under the eaves of your house and things like that. And sometimes uh, I've had critters, I had a family of flying squirrels chew uh, into, get into my shop and rather than repair the wood, I just put hardware cloth over the hole and, uh, and took work. care of that. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't look real good, but it's, <laughs> they can't get in there but it's now. effective. Yeah, and it's my shop. It's yeah, my right, house. right. But, uh, uh, and then, but I, in, the, in the deer, uh, we've had success uh, at Agri Center uh, with our plots using electric fence wire. You know, leaning it out at about a 45 degree angle and having a good powerful shock on that charger. Mm -hmm. You know, and that t tends to help a yeah. bunch. All right, that's good stuff, Mr. D, because yeah, we definitely know they're out there, but we're pushing them out. You said they were here first. Yeah, so, I yeah. don't know how much we're pushing them out. We're just, they're piling on top of each other. I yeah, think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nowhere else to go, right? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you much. In your lung, you see a lot of different types of weeds in your, in your, in your lung. Right here we have some dallas grass in your lawn. We see this all the time in uh, Bermuda grass, your zoysia grass. And a lot of people want to know how to control that, that, that grass in your lawn. A lot of things you can do if you're not too, not, you don't have too much in there, you can go out there and pull it up. That'd be the best thing to do. Catch you a moist day when the soil out after the rain. And go out there, it'd be easy to pull, it'd be easy to pull this out of, out, of, out of the lawn. But then, uh, if not, you want to use some kind of chemical to spray on there, some type of herbicide to spray on there. Quinclorex, MSMA. You can tell that if you still have some MSMA to be good to use on this grass here to control that. But one of the things that you might want to do is just make sure you read the label and tell you how much to spray on here. And all this is based on a healthy turf. If you have a real good healthy turf, you will see, uh, you will see less weeks in your lawn in there. But one of the things to do is control this grass here early and you, before it goes to seed, you have less grass in your lawn for next year. All right, here's our Q&A segment. We have some good questions here, y'all ready? Ready. All right, these are good. Uh, here's our first viewer email. Is it true that Japanese holly does not get boxwood blight like traditional boxwoods? And this is from Kristen uh, via YouTube. So is that true? Japanese hollies don't get boxwood? That's true. It's true. Yes. Okay. And the reason why is because boxwoods and hollies are two different species, two different. and the boxwood blight is just, that's why it's called boxwood Boxwoods. blight. It's it's related to just boxwoods, mm -hmm. and it'll only get on boxwoods. But I know this is, people get confused. The leaves the are leaves. The similar, but but no, it, it 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 will not get that. Right, leaves are similar. You have to look opposite or alternate. You got to know which one. Mm -hmm. But so there you have it, Christian. All right. Mm -hmm. Here's our next viewer email. This is interesting. I have fought the evil squash vine borers for several years, and I am trying vine borer traps. 
they catch a lot of these nasty bugs. Today, I caught 14 in just a few hours. Do vine borer traps work, or am I just calling vine borers from three counties to come feast on my zucchini? <laughs> so what do y'all think about that? Do the vine borer traps work, or am I just calling vine borers from three counties, Mr. Deep, three? <laughs> you know, may, maybe so, and the folks in the other three counties probably appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, they probably do, right? You know, it's the same question we have with UV light right. that attract insects and bug zappers and all that, or, or am I just attracting them? I know I'm killing them a lot, but, and you know, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to the question. My, my question would be, uh, are you still having vine borers infect your squash? And if you are, then no, they're not no, working, right. even though you're catching them and killing them. But, right. but if, if they're not, if you don't have any vine borer problems in your squash, then, then yes, it's working. I know we've successfully eradicated a couple of insects using traps, pheromone traps. Okay. One is the screw worm mm -hmm. back several years ago down along the Mexi Mexican border. And, uh, and then the bow weevil mm -hmm. uh, and cotton yeah, yeah. pheromone traps were very heavily utilized to eradicate that insect. So traps will, will work, they will attract and they will catch, but the bottom line is, are you uh, controlling, it, are you keeping them from infecting your plants? Right, your I would agree with plants. that, because yeah, my question too would be, okay, so you caught, you 14. Know, 14, mm -hmm. right, but did they lay the eggs mm -hmm. before you caught them? Yeah. yeah. I tend to keep on, keep on, keep on keeping on and, and, and check that out. Uh -huh. And my other, are, are they also spraying, you know, right. utilizing pesticides too in conjunction with this. Uh, and um, if you're doing that, you may be overkilling, you know, right. maybe a little overkill. Right. But either way it goes, yeah, your neighbors three counties away or sure appreciate it. They sure do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the question. All right. Here's our next viewer email. What is this caterpillar on my tomato plants? And this is from Ms. Ella. Arlington, good picture, Miss Ella. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah. that's a yellow striped army worm. Uh -huh. You can see the inverted Y mm -hmm. on his head, mm -hmm. and very, very common this time of the year. Uh, I, some of our plots out at uh, up at Murray State yesterday, I saw one about an inch and a half long, and then one about three eighths of an inch long. Huh. So you know you can see different sizes of them, and they. Uh, but that's what it is, yellow striped army worm. Right. And how would you control it? Any of the, the uh, recommendations in the red book, uh, <laughs> let's see here. There's about uh, anything for the, will control the fruit worm and the horn worm. Uh, BT, I'd try yes. BT first and, uh -huh. and see if that'll work. Uh, I'm not real sure how good BT is on army worms. What's been your experience with BT on army worms? You better worms? get them in the larva stage. Yeah, very, so. very, yeah. very small. Very larva, small. Very, very small, small larval stage. Right. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then uh, carbaryl, cyfluthrin, bifenthrin, zeta cypermethrin, esphenvalerate, permethrin. This is spinosad. So yeah. permethrin from the yeah. good old chrysanthemum. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but BT works because yeah, you had to catch them. Yeah, they're they're small. small. Synthetic mm -hmm. they're small. Yep. The smaller they are, the easier they are to yeah. kill. I mean, if you get them real small, you can probably kill them with, with safer soap. But they're you probably could. Eight right. inch long. Right, you probably could. Yeah. That's a good but, point. Uh, but, uh, it's kind of kind of hard to catch them that small. Right. Usually they're that big. Yeah, when you see them, they are. See them. Yeah. All right. So there you have it, Miss Ella. Thank you for the question. All right, here's our next fear email. My cucumbers are coming in yellow and gold. Are they still good to eat? And this is from Miss Mary right here in Memphis. Yellow and gold. But can you eat them? Look at me. <coughs> can you eat them, Miss Nick? You wouldn't eat it. My mama oh, said, boy. throw them to the hogs when they're like, they're <laughs> overripe. You hadn't been picking them uh -huh. in a timely manner. And it, it, when they get there, it won't hurt you. They're uh -huh. not going to be toxic or anything, right. but they tend to get bitter <laughs> as they get overripe. Uh -huh. And I would, uh, I would chunk them, you know, you save the seed out. I mean, wherever you throw them, you're going to have a cucumber right. come up because right. they're, they're right. getting that close to being overripe. So I would say they're not good to eat, in my opinion. All right, let's hear another opinion. <laughs> so what do you we, think? You, well, that's right. They're bitter. I mean, They're bitter. it's not going to hurt you, but you won't like them. Right. So, yeah, I would do the same. Compost pile. Some, do something with them. All right. Or hogs. Feed them hogs. Yeah, well, if you... Feed them to dogs. you got a Vietnamese pot belly pig. You, you, they love them. Come on, Joe. never know. That's what Mama did. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do what Mama did, right? Throw them over the fence to the hogs. <laughs> Throw them over to the hogs. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, overripe. 
At one time, it was probably green, and then it would have yeah, been fine. Loses its, you know, chlorophyll and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and it goes yellow to gold. Because some of them you just you you can't find. Yeah. You know, you know, you miss it. Right, yeah, it's hidden real well. well. They, will they, they, they can try camouflage. They, yeah, try they sure can. Uh -huh. They can definitely do that. Yeah. All right, Miss Mary. Self-preservation. They want to go to seed. And oh, they want to go to seed. That's right. right. They want to go to seed. Sir. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, there you have Miss Mary. They want to go to seed. So Mr. Demons, Joe, we out of time. It was fun. Yeah. Fun as always. All right. Remember. We love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you have any gardening problems, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We have about a thousand videos on all sorts of topics. And if you can't find your answer, drop us a line with your question. We'll see if we can't help you out. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.